Welcome to RICO 12. My name is Justin, and I am a son of an all-powerful and all-loving God and a recovering addict, and I'm blessed to be the host of this meeting and podcast. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addiction of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. Speakers from our past meetings have represented so many fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, and we look forward to continuing to add to that diversity of speakers and background. Today's speaker for the 155th meeting is Peg O'Connor, whose topic will be Higher and Friendly Powers. We will get, uh, we'll get to her talk in the Q&A afterwards in just a minute. First, for some business. Recently, a new service in the family of, grow, of a, in the growing family of the RICO 12 recovery resources went live. It's another recovery meeting podcast called RICO 12 Shares. And RICO 12 Shares is an open to anyone, anytime, shares only, unaffiliated 12-step meeting. We, are, we all are welcome to record a solution-based share that is uploaded to be part of a short 20-minute recorded recovering meeting available in podcast format anytime, anywhere. To listen to or to learn more and to record a share of your own, please visit www.rico12.com forward slash shares or click on the links in the show notes that I'll have up or in the chat of the live meeting that I'll have up. There are also a couple of other RICO 12 family of recovery resources on the horizon, and I'm super excited about these adventures and additional recovery resources. RICO 12 is a self-supporting service, and we appreciate your help in keeping us uh, working our 12th step in this manner. We gratefully accept one-time contributions through PayPal and Venmo, through the links in the chat and show notes. And we also have started a new monthly subscription program called RICO 12 Spearheads. To join in and help support these cool projects, please consider donating at rico12.com forward slash support or click on the links in the chat of the live meeting or in the show notes of the podcast. We look forward each week to receiving the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'll introduce today's guest speaker, which is another RICO 12 first-time speaker and excited about that, Peg O'Connor. Here's a little bit about Peg. Peg O'Connor, PhD, is a professor of philosophy at Gustavus Adolphus. I probably butchered that pronunciation. Close enough. Close enough. Awesome. College in St. Peter, Minnesota. Her training is in moral philosophy, feminist philosophy, addiction studies, and the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein. And I may have butchered that too. Maybe not. Pretty darn close. (laughs) She believes that philosophy helped her to get and remain sober, avoiding Alcoholics Anonymous for the first 20 years of her sobriety because of the concept of a higher power. She is focused on using some of the great canonical thinkers in Western philosophy to eliminate dimensions of addiction. She further shares this in her new book, Higher and Friendly Powers, Transforming Addiction and Suffering and Suffering. Peg has been kind enough to send along her book that we will be doing a giveaway with at the end of this meeting. So stick around to learn how you may be able to get a free copy of Higher and Friendly Powers. Take it away, Peg. The floor is yours. Well, thanks, Justin. And hello to everyone out there. And thanks to Justin for having me as a guest and for having RICO 12 and all of its growing versions. I mean, what what a, what an absolutely wonderful community that you are creating here. So I'm Peg and I'm an alcoholic. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about my stories and I'll tell you a little bit about why higher power was such a barrier to me and why the expression higher and friendly powers is more accurate to, um, I think, the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it may be a bit of a contentious claim. So here it goes. So I'm Peg O'Connor. Yay, it's St. Patrick's Day. Nice Irish Catholic girl who went to 13 years of Catholic school. And it didn't always go so well for me. But um, one of the things that was so clear in my Catholic upbringing, so I'll just out myself here, I'll, I'll be 58. So um, I started drinking when I was just going to turn 14. So it's the late, late 70s, early 80s. And my sense of God was as an all-seeing, all-knowing, not exactly benevolent kind of God. I think one of my first theological opinions was, God was a peeping Tom, because the nuns would always say to me, Margaret, God is always watching you. There was no privacy, and I always felt like I was being surveilled, and I was afraid of God, and I was afraid that I was a sinner, that I was doing wrong things. You know, we Catholics go to confession, and we're supposed to say everything that we've done wrong, and I had plenty of things to say that I had done wrong. That wasn't the issue. 
but I always wondered, why do I have to confess if God already knows this? It always seemed a slight of hand for me. And um, for a variety of reasons, I started drinking hard as a 13 or 14 year old. Um, one had to do with some sexual abuse as a younger kid. And one had to do with coming to see that I didn't like boys. And so to use the language of the time with no offense to anyone who's younger than me who uses these words differently, but lesbo, dyke, queer, not the things that one wanted to be at St. Bernard Central Catholic High School in Massachusetts. And I started drinking and I took to it like a duck to water. And for me, it was, I was so uptight and felt like I had to control myself so much because I was always afraid of being found out, found out about the abuse, found out about, you know, my liking my best friends in different kinds of ways. So there were two things going on. And so I would drink to try to fit in. We've all done this, where there's a brief magical moment where we've consumed just enough, where everything seems great. And then we quickly rocket past that. So the third time of my trident fork of shame was that I started drinking differently from my friends. And so I was just steeped in shame all the time. It, it's, it's what I knew. And my drinking, as I became more ashamed, just kept accelerating, 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 accelerating. And I managed to graduate from high school, although I did almost get expelled. Um, it was at a school dance. I was drinking heavily. I was a blackout drinker from the get-go. And I was in a blackout. And I was at a school dance and one of the nuns was there wearing lay person's clothing, not wearing the full habit. And out of this lippy mouth comes, and your clothes are ugly too. Um, not, not a great move to make. And so they were going to expel me, but, but they didn't as a, as a matter of good luck. But my parents said, you know, if you drink, you get caught again. And they had caught me multiple times, but it's the late seventies. It's the early eighties. You didn't send kids to treatment then because kids weren't alcoholics. Alcoholics were old men living down on the railroad tracks or, you know, the, not even the businessmen who are having the two or three martini lunch like that. I mean, definitely operating with a certain conception of alcoholic, but I knew I was an alcoholic. And actually, interestingly enough, my algebra teacher recognized that I was an alcoholic. How? I don't know. So sophomore year in high school, Sister Mary Sullivan, my algebra two teacher, was giving me back my algebra test along with a little meeting card from AA. I have no idea how she knew that because I hadn't been caught by the school yet, but clearly she was reading something in me. And I think that's one of the things that we who are in recovery can do. We recognize the suffering in others because we see ourselves in others really well. I mean, I think in the best of recovery, we become people of remarkable empathy. And so I, I'm grateful for that. But there was Sister Mary Sullivan giving me this card, which I did not know what to do with. So I graduated high school and I went to college where I was a, a heavy binge drinker and I wouldn't drink during sports season. And I would tell myself, well, see, I can stop. That I would start up again at the end of the season never counted as evidence. So, um, you know, the fact that I could stop for the fall season, stop for the winter season, but that I always picked up to me proved that I was not an alcoholic because I did stop for those. Sometimes it would be a couple of months. Um, but the question got called for me. Um, I was in a horrible car accident right after I had graduated from college and I hadn't been drinking, but I would have been drinking a couple hours later. And a couple of things happened. I landed in the hospital. I was, I was banged up pretty badly and had a severe concussion. And I remember the nurse came around with various pain medications because I had broken bones, massive contusions. I mean, I was black and blue literally for about seven months. And I remember the nurse, you know, had those little, um, plastic Dixie cups, I'm like, oh, what's in there? And I remember she was offering me pain medications and I had the clear and distinct thought, Betty Ford, here I come. So this is 1987. First Lady Betty Ford has founded the Betty Ford Treatment Center out in California. What a remarkable service she did for all of us in recovery. But my thought was, oh crap, if I start taking pain medications, I know how good I was with alcohol. And I knew how good I was with cocaine. The only reason I stopped using cocaine was it gave me absolutely debilitating headaches. So that, that was a very good thing. And the concussion that I had actually, I think in some ways is responsible for me not even having a desire to drink. 
I describe myself as having been cognitively and emotionally flatlined for months after that. And knowing what I know about concussions now, it makes sense. And in part, I didn't even care enough about myself to want to drink. And I realized, well, I haven't had a drink in a little while now. Let me see how long I can go. And drawing from my history of maybe having a month of not drinking and then starting up again and then another month, I thought, well, I don't know how long I'll go. I'll see how long I go, but maybe this time will be different. But in some ways, I fully expect that my past behavior is predictive of my future re- behavior. And it hasn't been. So this experiment has been going on since August 1st, 1987. So that's a good long time. I have been sober now for much of my life. So 35 out of 57 and a half years, do the math, do the fractions, Uh, but it's a long time. And um, I had tried one AA meeting as an undergraduate at college. And part of the reason I went to the meeting was, um, I don't know, remember how this happened, but I met this very cute girl and she was going and I thought, well, she's cute and she's going to an AA meeting. Well, I'll just follow her there. And I swear my rear end was hovering above the seat. I could not bring myself to sit down fully because right away it started with how it works. You know, many meetings start with how it works. And that immediately had me back on my heels in a defensive position because I thought of all the things I am, I am pretty honest and I know I have a problem. And so what's all this about? I'm going to fail if I'm not honest. No, I'm being honest. And then combined with the reading of the steps, that notion of higher power as we understood him, that qualifier did nothing for me because that as we understood him is already chock-a-block with Christian-centric meaning and connotations. And so I thought, wait a minute, how the hell is this God in front of whom I feel so much shame and who has seen every wrong and shameful and sinful thing I've done, I'm supposed to turn my will over and then he is going to do something for me. It wasn't going to happen. So I pretty much ran out of that meeting and never went back to an AA meeting until, um, as Justin mentioned, 20 years in my sobriety. So I've been sober a good long time. And during that time, I had gone off to graduate school and I got my degree and I started teaching and In many ways, I had a perfect life. My alcoholic identity was just, for me, a fact of the matter. I wasn't all that public about it. I kind of cordoned it off from other parts of my life. All of my friends and colleagues knew I didn't drink, and they maybe even knew I was alcoholic, but it wasn't kind of a vibrant living part of myself, you know? And I woke up one morning, and I had this weird thought that horrified me. I thought, I'm a mouse running around the trim board of my own life. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And for me, what it meant was I wasn't taking up space in my own life. I was meeting all these different benchmarks of, of what it means to be a good academic. You know, I'm trying to teach as best I can. I'm trying to publish. I'm doing all my committee and service work. And I had the perfect life in so many ways. So, um, I had a loving partner and we were both tenured and promoted at the same college. We were the statistical anomaly. We were the one couple in our discipline who had that. And I felt like I don't recognize myself anymore. And what I realized was I felt like I had lost myself. So the great Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard says the greatest hazard of all, losing yourself, is the very loss that you fail to notice. You'll notice everything else first. If you lose $5, if you lose your glasses, you'll be looking around for them forever and a day, but you don't recognize when you lose yourself. And so my addiction was one way of losing myself. I was trying to lose my shameful, misfit, completely um, self-hating, self-loathing self. I lost myself. I wanted to lose. I didn't know who I was. And then in recovery, it turns out I lost myself as well. I lost myself in kind of meeting all the external demands, having a beautiful life, but not taking up space. I didn't know who I was anymore. I was functioning, I say, on a very high level of autopilot. And I think many of us who struggle with addiction, 
we can function on that high level of autopilot, but we're not fully living. And it really got brought home to me when, again, this philosopher Kierkegaard, who, who utterly terrifies me, I had to stop reading him for 20 years because he spoke so deeply to my heart and to my soul. He noted that happiness is despair's greatest hiding place. That despair, by what Kierkegaard means by that, he might say despair or me, he might mean, mean dread or angst, anxiety, not in the psychologized, you know, medicalized self, but the sense that something is so fundamentally out of whack, so out of balance. And my life was out of balance because, as I say, the lights were on, but I wasn't home. You know, I was just running my life. And so I treated my life like a gigantic snow globe. I gave it a gigantic shake and it's turned me on this course of working more with philosophy and addiction, because as Justin said, um, I do believe philosophy helped me to get and stay sober because I could ask myself questions about what kind of person do I want to be? What are my character traits? What do I owe others? How do I know myself? What is self-trust? And maybe someday, what is self-forgiveness? I mean, I think there's nothing harder than forgiving ourselves. And I realized that I needed to do my sobriety differently. That in sobriety, I had become somewhat dogmatic in the sense of something had worked really well for me for 20 years. And in some ways it still was working, but I needed to become more flexible and nimble in my recovery. So I met some cool women who were going to AA. And once again, it's like, well, these are cool women. I could go with them. I seem to like the people. Um, and it was really important. But oddly enough, even 20 years, well, it's more than that. It would be, da, 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 da. you know, at that point, it was about 25 years after my first AA meeting. I had the exact same response to how it works and the language of God as we understood him. So being a nerdy little academic, I decided, well, I want to investigate this concept of higher power because why is that ringing a bell with me? So then I did some more work and I had the good fortune to um, do a fellowship at the at Hazelden in Center City, Minnesota. So, you know, the, the mothership, the flagship of um, inpatient treatment. And I came upon a reference that Bill Wilson made to the great American philosopher, William James, who lived between 1842 and 1910 as being a co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought, well, that's interesting because by the time Bill had his big sudden conversion in the Charles B. Towns Hospital in 1934, James had been dead 24 years. So what's going on here? So I did more digging. And so Bill Wilson, when he had that sudden experience, so you know, if, if you've read um, As Bill Sees It, some of the history of AA, he's in the drying out tank one more time. He's living with Lois's parents. He's got no money. He's a failure. So his brother-in-law kicks him the money one more time for one more attempt to dry out. And so there he is feeling full of despair and full of a little bit of defiance. And he says, you know, if there is a God, show yourself. I'm willing to do anything, anything just to have this um, desire removed from me. And he said, and suddenly I felt this big gust that I knew it wasn't wind, it was spirit. And my desire to drink was lifted. And not long after, he thinks, oh my gosh, am I hallucinating? Which is a plausible worry given alcohol withdrawal can cause hallucinations. And alcohol withdrawal was oftentimes treated with belladonna that could cause hallucinations. But his friend, Ebby Thacker, who had consumed like he did, had stopped drinking for a while and had read William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, which is this encyclopedic book. It's hundreds of pages that was originally delivered as lectures where William James, who believes that spiritual impulses are part of human nature, just as much as psychological states, just as much as biological and chemical states of our bodies, spiritual impulses are part of what it means to be a human being. And he gave a series of lectures in which he was looking at all kinds of examples of people for whom spiritual impulses burn as an acute fever, or people for whom spiritual impulses are their, I love this expression, their habitual center of personal energy. 
And so he compiles all these different stories from, yes, the Christian, in particular Catholic saints, because Catholics have a very well-deserved reputation for having kind of big aha kinds of conversions and engaging in all kinds of extreme acts of asceticism and different kinds of ecstatic activities. But he gathered all these other examples from Buddhist and Muslim and Hindu traditions. And he talked about higher and friendly powers. So Bill Wilson took the term higher power from William James. And Bill Wilson had been raised uh, against a Calvinist backdrop. And so what was familiar to him, what his overbeliefs were, were a providential God who has a will for us and who can intervene in our lives in a kind of way. And that's the kind of notion of God that gets put right into the 12 steps, even with that qualifier, as we understood him. As soon as you put the him in there, you're, you're bringing along all that other baggage. But William James counts as higher and friendly powers, something that's far more expansive and inclusive. And William James was the intellectual godson of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great American transcendentalist who talked about ideals of truth and beauty, that could be a higher and friendly power. And enthusiasm for humanity, something more, um, the imminent divinity in things, moral principles, patriotism, and then two really interesting ones. One comes from Henry David Thoreau during his time at Walden Pond when he wants to get away from the hurly-burly chaotic life of little Concord, Massachusetts. And he builds a little cabin out on a lake that isn't too far from home. So he can walk home to his mother's for lunch, but I digress. But um, Henry David Thoreau is out walking one day in the mist. And he says, I feel this kind of communion with the pine needles that we are equally part of nature. And he said, it felt like the pine needles were befriending me. That, in many ways, has pride of place in James's examples of what a higher and friendly power is. Pine needles in the mist, walking in nature. But what he also says is a better self, a better version of yourself can be a higher power. And so a higher power doesn't do anything to you. A higher power enables you to do something. So the origin of a conversion doesn't have to be an external God who reaches down and removes the desire to use from Justin or from Peg, but that higher power is just a belief that there's something more than little embattled you. And if you can reach out to it or reach inward to yourself and you become willing to make changes, you can undergo a remarkable spiritual transformation. So Bill Wilson had one kind of conversion. He had the big sudden tsunami where it feels like a God from outside came in and did just that, you know, took out that desire to drink. And now, you know, here is Bill transformed. But for many of us, and this is where I include myself, I believe I authored my own conversion by becoming willing to try one more time by being willing to try to run this experiment for however long it might go. And the question of, well, don't you need to have faith in order to recover? James would answer, we have faith in so many dimensions of our life. Faith is pervasive throughout every aspect of our living. I have faith that my technology is going to work. I have faith that people are in general going to obey the rules of the road. Faith is just a willingness to live on possibilities or to live on maybes where the results are not guaranteed nor are they certified in advance. It's simply a willingness. And so it's important to distinguish willingness from willpower or self-will run riot. Willingness is an active engagement. It's always based in action to try to do something. Willpower we think of as just a repressive thing, to be able to say no to things. There's many reasons why people can't sober up through sheer willpower alone. 
because you can't just say no to things. And this is a wonderful insight from James. He said, you know, people who really are getting primed for a conversion, so primed to change their habitual center of personal energy, they really need to have two things in mind. And the first thing is a sense of the incompleteness or wrongness of your present way of living. And I know in my active addiction, I could enumerate everything that was wrong with what I was doing. I could just go through reams of paper. But if we get stuck there, that's just going to cause us to spiral downwards. So in order to get out of that, James says, you need to have a positive ideal that you long to compass. You need to have some positive view that can be a point of orientation for you, a point towards which you can move. And I think one of the many wonderful things about AA is that oftentimes when we come in the rooms, we can't generate that positive ideal for ourselves yet. It's just too damn hard. We're so good at that first step of the wrongness and incompleteness. And I, in some ways, describe myself and others in recovery early, especially, as being hitchhikers. We hitchhike on someone else's positive ideals. And it could be, well, gosh, I remember when Justin came into the rooms and look at him now. It gives me something that I can say, I want to be like that. And I know oftentimes they say when you're looking for a sponsor, pick someone who's got something that you want. That can play that role of that positive function. And then when we do undergo these transformations, James's language is wonderful. He said, we are regenerated. We are rejuvenated. We are transformed. We are reborn. We become different people because that habitual center of energy is different because it burns with the spiritual impulses. And I think one of the many wonderful things about recovery is that those spiritual impulses burning like that makes us, one, very protective of our own sobriety, and two, very much, to go back to an earlier point, we're full of empathy where we see that suffering and we know what that life was like, and we know how it can be different because we are living a different kind of life. And it makes us, here comes that willingness, it makes us willing to reach our hands out to help others. and. You know, I, I know social scientists and, and other kinds of addiction medicine specialists, you know, wonder why does AA work? It works for a variety of reasons, but for me, one of the reasons it works is that it makes each one of us part of a much broader we or us. And that can be that higher and friendly power that we can be continuous with. It expands us. And so you know, what is life like in recovery for me? It doesn't mean that it's without pain. It doesn't mean we don't suffer. But I think for me, it means I've got a deep abiding sense that I will be okay. Even if I can't really even imagine what that okay would look like. And I know that I'm going to get knocked flat on my rear end multiple times, but I'm always going to get up. Not because, you know, I peg am you know, superhero, so strong and powerful, but because I know how to reach my hand out and ask for help. And I know that there are others who will help me do it. So for all of us who grew up and who used and felt lonely and isolated, I think that programs like AA, other kinds of um, mutual help groups work because each one of us becomes part of a bigger whole. And I couldn't be more grateful for that. And so I think that's a good place to stop. Man, beautiful. Thank you so much, Peg. I got I got a whole page of one-liners and notes and everything that I just love. I wrote several questions. And uh, as a reminder to our live audience, if you have a question for Peg, please type it in the Q&A link at the bottom of your window. We'll get to those and, and ask those questions. Um, one of the one-liners that you said a couple of times, but I was in the middle of writing a note uh, both times, so I didn't catch it, was the the uh, the habitual center of, and tell me a little bit, what is that, yes. the end of that and what does that mean again? I love this expression. So it's 1902. And here's William James trying to answer the question, what makes you be you? And he says, each one of us has a habitual center of personal energy. And it can be anything. So one of the examples that I talk about is a professional athlete. So I'm a tennis player. I play a ton of tennis. I, I watched, um, what's it called? Breakpoint on Netflix about these young professionals where everything in their life is tennis. Everything they do is geared towards 
will this move me up the rankings? Everything else is um, a distraction or something, you know, we're going to defer and not work on it. So, you know, being a professional tennis player, an athlete at the height of her physicality, height of her abilities, that's that center of energy. But what happens when there's an injury? Or what happens when something else happens? And it can cause for me what I cause uh, what I call an existential concussion. When your habitual center gets suddenly ripped away from you or undergoes some fundamental change quickly that maybe you didn't you know, agree to, that you are profoundly lost. It's an existential concussion. You can't orient yourself in the kind of way. You can't make the kind of sense that you do. And I just think that's a, it's a wonderful question to ask anyone, you know, what is the center of your energy? What, what is, what is it that makes you? And then what are you willing to do to, to realize that? And, and James is, is quite realistic, you know, habitual centers of energy can be bad too. They can be greed or avarice. You know, they can be all those sorts of things. It makes you be you in part because your actions spring from that center and your actions shore up and reinforce that center. But I love that expression. Yeah, it's super powerful. I, I also loved your uh, the, the definition you gave of faith, part of which was, you know, a willingness to live on maybes when results are not guaranteed in advance. Love that. Um, is that something that you kind of pinned together or is that something you well, got that's from, from That's from William James, but William I realized James. that that was, I, that's the definition of faith that I had worked with when I wanted to see, I want to see how long this can go. Maybe this time will be different. And I had to take the actions, right? If you wish, well, maybe this time will be different and you don't do anything different. We all know that's just going to end in disaster. But if I think maybe it'll be different and I change my actions, um, one of the things that James says, and I think he's right, is that that willingness to live on maybes and possibilities helps to bring about facts. It helps to bring about the fact in which you believe. So maybe I won't drink in this 24 hours. The actions you take that bring that about make the fact that you don't drink in 24 hours. So are having a belief in something or having a belief in our own ability to change helps to bring about that fact. So that's why I say, you know, each one of us can author our own conversion, whether it's a, a sudden one or whether it's one of those more gradual ones. I had a more gradual one. And most of us who stop drinking or using have that kind of slow, gradual, where we start doing some things differently. And maybe we start to have some different aspirations or goals, or we become willing to try new things. And the results, whether it's Bill Wilson's big, huge tsunami conversion, or Peg O'Connor, she tried for six years and kept messing up, but then finally, the results are the same. James says the origins of a conversion doesn't matter. So if you do believe in a providential God, that's great. That hypothesis works for you. But if you don't believe in that, you can craft your own higher and friendly power if it's a hypothesis that works for you. And the work of it is always seen in the, in the results it produces. Love it. Thank you. Thank you for, for walking through that. Just, just opening my eyes to new angles of, of terms that I well, I never think that I know it all, but I think I have a solid foundation with, and I, I love seeing the different angles of these things. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and that kind of takes me to one of the one of the things you shared that you know, at twenty plus years, you felt you needed to take the snow globe of your life and just shake it up and 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 find a new foundation, find new diff, new ways of looking at things. What are a couple of other things that in that snow globe shake up, kind of? your eyes were open to it a different from a different perspective? Oh, well, I realized that I needed to integrate my alcoholic identity into more of my life. And my work took a very distinct turn. And it made me a better teacher, I think, as well. I mean, I'm very out in my classes about, you know, being a recovering alcoholic and, and all of that. And I found that once I started being more out about that, one, students, well, it humanized me to students. Um, 
And it also made me willing to kind of teach in different kinds of ways and be in the classroom as a more genuine person. I mean, I've always been very informal in my classes. You know, I'm not behind the podium doing anything like that. But I, I feel like I love teaching more because there's a great honor in meeting someone where they are, you know, in their thinking. So, you know, I'm always with 18 to 22 year olds and it's really helped me, I think, to have a genuine humility. All the things that they know about that I don't know about, things that they can do that didn't exist when I was their age and to bear witness to their worries and their concerns and their fears and to just acknowledge them and not poo-poo them in a kind of way. And I, I just feel eternally grateful for that. Love it. And as you incorporated, you know, recovery into your daily life, into your teaching, um, did that change the percept or the feedback you got from your students? Did that open them up that much more to, for you to be open with them or what were you, what was I, your I think experience? It does. Like? You know, and not not for all students, um, but I've certainly had students who would say, you know, can I come talk to you and then say whether they themselves were struggling or whether they had a family member struggling. I mean, young people in colleges are struggling with mental health issues in ways that we weren't, say, when I was in college in, in the early to mid 80s. And, you know, some people say, is it just being diagnosed more and better, you know, these mental illnesses, or are kids generally more distressed? And and I think it's the latter. I mean, it's some of the former, but it's mostly the latter. And, you know, I'm I'm very clear with them about feeling as if I wasted a lot of my undergraduate opportunity and almost getting kicked out of school. I'm honest with them that I went to my first grad program for three days and dropped out during orientation because I thought, I can't do this in part to say, you know what, we can mess up, but we can repair. So I talk a lot to my students about responsibility and that responsibility runs in multiple directions. Responsibility isn't just blame, but it's about being forward looking and it's also kind of looking laterally and that an important part of responsibility is knowing how to repair when you have made mistakes. And I know, so I can talk about, you know, in, in recovery, oftentimes we want to be able to identify when we've made a mistake and then we want to make amends. And here's what making amends means. It isn't just an apology. I mean, a verbal apology um, that isn't accompanied with a change in action is just an ornamental knob. It spins. It might make me feel better. Well, I apologize. Why can't you accept it? And then I can go in victim mode, right? Well, ugh. Um, but to say that much of what we do in life involves making mistakes and repairing them and to say, and we get to repair them. And sometimes something that is repaired is stronger than it originally was. Yeah. What a gift. What a gift. What a beautiful gift. Thank you. Uh, Johnny from our audience says, thank you so much. Kierkegaard and AA. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's amazing combination says Johnny, uh, and, and asks, do you sponsor? How do you work your 12th step? Do you, do you sponsor or how do you do that? I, I don't, I don't sponsor and I'm still in and out of AA. So, you know, now we're 35 years in recovery. Um, I'm in and out of AA. So I have great respect for it, for the fellowship and for the program. And, I don't sponsor because I've never officially worked the 12 steps. That's one. And two, I don't sponsor officially because I'm so aware that I am used to being a teacher and that's a fundamentally different kind of relationship. I, I have to be careful when I lead AA meetings as well. It's like, I need to check my teacher self where I'm, you know, I describe myself, my teaching style is intellectual border collie. You know, I want students to roam around and explore, but then I come nipping at them if they're about to dive off the face of the cliff. So I'm, I'm aware that um, I, I'm not the best to lead a meeting because I can't always shut that off. You know, you do something for 28 years. 
for you know in that in that kind of intensity it's hard to shut it off so when I go to an AME, AE meeting I just I mostly just want to be there as one of everyone else and oftentimes an AA meeting I never make reference to what I do or what I write about because AA is democratic and they don't need to know you know differences in education or differences in titles or what someone works on that to me kind of queers the meeting space in a not good way. And, and I don't want to introduce that. Yeah, I totally get that. I, I'm, I'm a coach. I, I coached baseball my whole life, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that there's strengths in coaching, but it also turns into manipulation. If I'm trying to do it in a recovery type setting, if I'm yeah. sponsoring somebody as a coach, it almost yeah. turns into a manipulation rather than a, you know, so I get what, it. what's the AA equivalent of stale second? <laughs> exactly. Let's see. Tug my ear now. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, another follow up. Oh, this is so. This is a little bit of a personal question for you, Johnny. But uh, Peg, are you looking for a sponsor? Johnny wants to sponsor you uh, as a young queer nurse, ready to go. Says Johnny. <laughs> oh, I so. love it. I love it. I don't know. I don't. I. I honestly, I don't know. It's a good question. Well, if, if you and Johnny want to get uh, in contact, we can, we can facilitate that. Send me an email at uh, Rico 12 uh, pod at gmail.com. And maybe we can facilitate some additional conversation. So, but uh, good. All right. Let's see what other, uh, there's so much good stuff here. You know, um, you oh these questions. So you you listed a series of questions in the middle of your 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 talk here. Questions you wanted to ask yourself, and it was right around the time of the snow globe. What is self trust? How do I know myself? How do I forgive myself? And you said eventually, I think. Tell me, what is self trust? How what have you learned that self trust is now? So, I know that for me, early in my addiction one of the first things I lost was trust in myself because I would say, you're only going to have two, you're only going to have two, or you're, you're coming home at nine o'clock. And I couldn't trust myself. And so there that self-trust was lost about drinking. But the thing is when you lose self-trust, the scope of that loss extends. So I wouldn't trust myself about anything because I thought, well, I'm just a fundamentally untrustworthy person. So if I think this is a good thing to do, well, that's just probably a stupid, bad, wrong thing to do because I think it's a good thing to do. Um, And it's very hard to get that self-trust back. And for me, I would say, what's the way to put it? My coverage is still spotty all these many years in. And I think that one thing that we do is to one way we see the absence of self-trust I'm speaking for myself here I second guess myself all the time if I know this is the right thing to do or I know if I try turning that screw one more time it's going to snap off and then ding dong over here turns it one more time so then I can get doubly mad at myself because I've broken the screw and I've shown that I am such an idiot because I should have listened to myself or I shouldn't have gone against what I knew to be the right thing. And I think it's hard to get self-trust back. I think sometimes others will start trusting us before we can trust ourselves because we maintain, there's this uh, position in philosophy called privilege access, that each of us has privilege access to our own mind and mental space, you know, that we can Um, turn our little flashlight inwards and see everything that's in our mind or in our soul. And oftentimes what we see there is like, well, here are all the ways I screw up because I'm a screw up or here are the dirty things I've done, the shameful things I've done. And privileged access is, um, well, well, it's a scam um, because it is true that one, we can't survey the entire contents of our minds. And William James is quite clear on this. It's like, you know, we got the rational conscious mind, but we've got the subconscious. And actually what a conversion is, is when something from the subconscious works its way up and it breaks through the surface of the conscious mind, which has a kind of very crisp candy coating on it. But sometimes something suddenly rockets up, that was Bill Wilson, or more gradually sneaks its way up, um, that was Peg O'Connor. But to try to, to pierce that in a kind of way, 
but no one can totally survey themselves. And oftentimes it's others who have a much more accurate perspective on us. So for me, one of the ways that I come to trust myself and I come to know myself is understanding how others see me and what others see in me and what I'm doing or in what I'm saying. And that all has to do with surrounding myself with the right people. So the philosopher Aristotle says that Each one of us becomes who we are by what we do habitually. And Aristotle says that having the right sort of good moral people in your life can make you be a much better person. The contrary holds as well. If you are hanging out with people who are of kind of low moral quality, you know, maybe they're the they're the cheats or they're the liars or, you know, they're the people always going on the shortcut, always looking out for themselves. When you associate with other people and you start acting like they do, that harms your character. And so for me, um, I, I'm friendly with a lot of people, but I have a very tight cohort of people that if I were to go to them and say, you know, one of my friends is MB, MB, boom, I know she's right there. She has my best interest at heart. She's going to be direct. She's going to call it like she sees it. And that is and she's an AA. Um, yay, fellowship. So, I mean, that's that's how you start to recover self-trust is, is, you know, it's a little bit of a paradox that you've got to trust yourself a little bit to start trusting other people, but it starts to build in that same way. Same same thing with self-knowledge, you know, and, and I think this is true in early sobriety. You know, many of us just kind of feel like we are totally defeated and worthless. And if someone pays us a compliment, the first thing we have to do is deflect it. You know, I use all my Taekwondo blocks to deflect that because I can't actually be real, can it? And when we can start to hear other people say positive things about us and we can believe it, maybe just a little itty bitty bit, what a remarkable achievement for some of us. That, that was certainly true for me. I thought I was worthless. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. When you shared the, uh, you know, those people that you g- gather around you, you become more, you know, more, uh, I can't remember the words you use, but a better person, the better people you surround you with, the better people you become better. Um, it reminded me of a, an interview I heard with a, a ba- shocking, a baseball player who played in the 90s, late 80s and throughout the 90s. His name was Eric Davis. But uh, the interview I heard was a uh, the guy was asking him, how did you get out of the street life and away from that? Mm. And he just talked about, you know what, you are who you roll with. And I needed to roll with other people. Yep. And, and that really affected me back then. I was deep in my addiction then I was, but, but it, it woke me up. I need to roll with different people because if I am who I roll with, I'm in trouble. And I need to roll with other, other people. And I think that's what these rooms of recovery can do. Oh, I mean, yeah. we look for the light in somebody else's eyes, what they have. I want what you have. I want to start rolling with you. So um, yep. any other thoughts on that as I, as I brought that up? No, I, I think that is a great thumbnail description of Aristotle. The other thing Aristotle says that I love is that a friend is a second self. Yeah. And so when, when we lose those, those friends, you know, I hate it in our culture that we don't recognize the importance of friendship. And this is particularly true for people in recovery, that our friends are so important to us. And when we lose one of them, the idea, oh, it's just a friend. As if your relationships with friends are always second tier to a romantic relationship or a relationship with parents or with children. And particularly for for those of us who, you know, who don't have children, you know, our friends, they're our second selves. So when we lose one of them or when one of our friends really starts to drastically change, that's the other thing. So, you know, being in long-term recovery, having friends who go back out, you know, we feel that pain in a certain kind of way because that's our second self going back out there and doing it, you know? There's no such thing as, you know, in this context as, oh, just a friend. Mm. Mm. So powerful. Thank you. Uh, Before we wrap things up, Peg, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? Oh, final words of wisdom. Um, I guess 
for me, taking that definition of faith and making it be about anything that you decide can enable you to do something different that you want to do. I mean, that that's just, you don't have to believe in any doctrine. You don't have to believe in any particular God. Maybe you can just believe in yourself a little bit more and you can help to make that belief come true. Love it. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Peg. That was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting. And if we didn't get to any questions out there, or you were shy and didn't want to ask the question, please consider joining our WhatsApp community by sending an email to rico12pod at gmail.com and join in that community, ask questions there, answer others' questions that will come up. Uh, if you're inspired and want to share something of your insights in a 12-step type share, please go to RICO 12 shares uh, speak pipe link. And I've just put that right there in the chat of the meeting and it will be in the show notes. And this is what, how we're going to uh, give away the books here. Uh, the first two people who go and record a, a share based on what you learned in this meeting here will receive uh, Peg's book, uh, Higher and Friendly Powers. I'll send that out to you. So if you have not yet rated and reviewed the podcast and Apple podcast, please go do so now. It's a great way to work step 12 and sharing this message with others. I invite the audience to come back next week when we will be hearing from another RICO 12 first-time speaker, Lynette M., whose topic will be Living Step 10. Now, we've had a few people in the last two months share on different aspects of Step 10. And like, like I talked about earlier in here, I love seeing the different angles. It opens my eyes to whole new ways of seeing things. And man, Step 10 has been revolutionized for me over the last couple of months, and I look forward to seeing yet another new way. Now, let's launch off into the rest of our day with the responsibility pledge that Peg will say for us. Have at it, Peg. Thanks, Justin. I am responsible. When anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA to be there. And for that, I am responsible. Thank you, Peg. Keep coming back, everybody. Let's trudge this happy road of destiny together. Work it. You are worth it. Fight.